All right, it's right at the top of the hour. And uh, my name is Jennifer Luna. I'm the director of the Donito Career Center at the Steve Hicks School of Social Work. And today we're so happy to present uh, this week's Impact Hour, which will be uh, Social Workers in Sports, Empowering and Activating Athletes into Action. Um, our speakers today are uh, Suzanne Potts, who is, um, in addition to being uh, adjunct faculty at the, the Steve Hicks School of Social Work, um, she is also the National Director of Athletes for Hope. Um, and she'll be telling you a little bit more about that uh, great association um, and has been involved in the school for many years now in different roles. So we're thrilled to have uh, Suzanne join us. And we also have uh, Dr. Emmett Gill, who is the Chief Visionary Officer for Athletes and Advocates for Social Justice in Sports. Um, he is also the founder of the National, um, I'm sorry, the Alliance for uh, Social Workers in Sports, um, which is uh, the first organization that was created for social workers who are interested in working in sports or with athletes um, all the way from um, public school, elementary school to professional. Um, so pleased to have both Dr. Gill and um, Professor Potts here today. Um, I expect to see you both on the cover of Sports Illustrated Magazine at any time now. <laughs> and I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you. Wow, that is an introduction. Definitely, I'm not sure about being on the cover, but uh, lovely to think of that. That's awesome. So good to see everybody today. And um, Emmett, do we want to do quick introductions just for you and I? Or yeah, yeah, that's all right. Good. Go ahead, lead the way. Okay. So hi everyone. Uh, I'm Suzanne Potts, and I, um, as Jennifer so kindly mentioned, I have been an adjunct um, assistant professor at UT Austin for this is my tenth year. So I consider myself a Longhorn, even though I graduated from San Diego State University and I'm an Aztec at heart. Um, I also now bleed orange and burnt orange, excuse me. So um, I've loved my time at UT and have loved being in the school of social work. My primary classes are the capstone course for the graduate students. And I teach the information systems and communication class in the, the fall. So, um, really pleased to be here. I also teach a course at GW University for their sports philanthropy certificate around program design. So if you haven't picked up already, I am a complete dork and I like data and charts and graphs and things like that. So um, working with nonprofits to help them tell their story or to use data more effectively and storytelling is something that I'm really passionate about. And so um, I'll talk a little bit later about my work with Athletes for Hope, but um, basically have been connected to the school for at least 10 years and with Athletes for Hope for six years. Emmett, why don't I pass it over to you and then I'll talk about Athletes for Hope. Yeah, um, no, thank you. And, and, and Jennifer, um, thank you for putting this together, Sarah. Um, Suzanne, it's always a pleasure to work with you. I know that I think um, maybe 10 years ago, I started looking at issues of sports philanthropy and I'm just so happy you know, the Euro work, the work of um, Kathy Babiak at, at the University of Michigan. You know, you've just done tremendous work in terms of that space. Um, my name's Emmett Gill. I am also um, an adjunct at the University of Texas. At Austin, um, I think this semester, I'm teaching a social justice course, uh, do tell. And um, I'm also the a former clinical professor at UT, um, as well as a former director of student athlete wellness and personal development. Um, in our athletic department. And just really excited about the work. Um, you know, as Jennifer alluded to, I started, um, you know, trying to spread the gospel, so to speak, about social workers in sports about five years ago um, with the Alliance of Social Workers in Sports. Um, we're now about 225 or so members strong. Um, we've got social workers working in college athletics and pro athletics. Um, we actually just, a social worker was just hired um, as a director of mental health for the U.S. Olympic and Paralympic Committee. And so, you know, it's just, it's just incredible to me to, to see this work happening. And now um, I start another nonprofit, Athletes and Advocates for Social Justice in Sports, where we are helping athletes um, deal and cope with issues 
in college sports as well as help professional athletes um, mobilize their efforts. And so really excited about the work and I'm even more excited about the opportunity to speak with all of you today. Awesome. Yes, and I would add, I'm a proud Alliance of Social Workers and Sports member because when I stepped into this, which I'll talk about, um, I wanted to find out more about how I could get education or CEUs or kind of tie the work that I was doing in my day job to um, this, this greater good of knowledge. And I found Emmett at UT and was so pleased to link with him a couple of years ago. So um, it, it's a unique aspect of social work. And I think it's a growing aspect to, to Emmett's credit and the work that he's done with the Alliance of Social Workers. We have this growing group now of professionals, both clinical and more macro-focused social workers that are working in sports careers all over the globe. And so um, when we talk more about this, I'm very excited because I feel like uh, Emmett is a pioneer for all of this. And I think all of you now, just by having an interest in learning more about it, it's really gonna take off. There's, there's need everywhere for our people. <laughs> so I came into this early on as a program officer. I worked for Lance Armstrong and the Lance Armstrong Foundation. And so I had previously been working in grant management and taking my kind of macro hat and social work to grant management. And so when I came here to Austin, I was hired as their community program officer. And that's when I first put the pieces together of sports philanthropy and what it means to use your sport for good. And so um, Lance and a group of other athletes, Muhammad Ali, Mia Hamm, Andre Agassi, Jackie joyner Kersey, jo uh, Jeff Gordon, Alonzo Mourning, uh, Warwick Dunn. We have a huge group of founders at Athletes for Hope, but they started our organization 14 years ago to help connect athletes to philanthropy and causes that they're passionate about. So that's how I first learned about Athletes for Hope. Um, and I started working with them six years ago as a, as a consultant, really as a measurement and evaluation person. So again, taking those social work skills and helping them think through measuring their impact. That was what my job was. I don't think they initially thought, oh, we need a social worker on this, right? And so now I think that they know about social workers. We've had a couple of fabulous social work interns. I think sports philanthropy is getting clued into the awesome skill set that social workers have and the breadth and depth of abilities to support athletes and all these different things that we're going to talk about. So um, that's how I got to be here with Athletes for Hope. I'm now their national director and I work across the university programs connecting athletes to philanthropy. And um, I still do all their measurement and evaluation because I like charts and graphs. So, <laughs> Emmett, do you want to talk for a little bit about what you're working on now or is there anything else that we didn't cover in your intro? Yeah, I mean, um, well, just for everyone, I think that, you know, and, and we were sort of chopped it up before everybody came on. And, you know, it's, it's sort of like, you know, how do you, how do you get in this space, right? Um, you know, that's what everybody wants to know. How do you get in this space? Because, you know, on the one hand, you know, social workers is sort of that blue collar mental health professional, right? We're not, we're not sports psychologists. We're not counseling or clinical. And, you know, we're not that, we don't have those sexy titles. We're blue collar. Um, and often our salary sort of indicates that <laughs> nonetheless, how do you do that? Right. When you have this, this, this glamour of college and professional sports, I mean, for example, UT, you know, one of the most prolific um, uh, athletic departments in the country has been for some time. How do you how do you get in that space, or how do you get in that professional space where you've got the you know the LeBron James and the Steph Curry's and the Lance Armstrongs and the Ward Dunn's and all of these individuals? And so you know I'll really just go back into to, to sort of the beginning with me, you know, just in terms of realizing the skill set that you have, right? You, you've got a you've got an incredible skill set in social work if you look at the breadth of classes that you take. Suzanne Potts is a great example of that. You can get into sports through research and evaluation, which is a class I used to teach and a lot of people hate, but the reality is you can do that. Now you can get into sports via, you know, looking at social policy. Um, and then we have our fundamental, our foundation courses. Um, and I always have to give a thanks out to Jennifer who helped me pass my LMSW exam. So you've got your fundamental, you've got your human behavior courses and you've got your loss and grief and you've got your psychotherapy, you've got your narrative therapy, you've got your play therapy, you've got all of those things. But then with that, how do you merge it with you know, um, sports? And I think a lot of it has to be, you've gotta be a great salesperson or you gotta be a halfway decent salesperson in terms of what you bring. Like, you know, I say it to people all the time, if you're just getting into this because you wanna rub elbows with athletes, you're in the wrong business. 
-hmm. It's just not going to happen. It's, it's not going to happen because one, you've got to have an extra gear. Like if you've got five gears in your car, you need six. If you've got six, you need seven. Um, because one, you've got to sell yourself. And two, you've got to have something to sell. Like if you can't visualize what you can bring to that organization, then how are they going to visualize it? Yeah. Right. And so I'm walking into, and you know, truth be told, um, I was at the University of Texas at San Antonio um, when I got a call from then athletic director, Mike Perrin, who just said, you know, I heard about your work. You know, this guy, Dean's eyes keeps, you know, blowing up my phone. It's like, maybe you've got something to offer us. I'm like, yeah, sure, let's talk about it. Um, but I understood that there was an intersection between social work and sports. You've got kids who have trauma. You've got kids who have interactions with the criminal justice system. You've got athletes who are homeless. You've got kids who are part of the foster care system. That's everything that a social worker does and that we know. And no disrespect to any of our, you know, psychologists out there, but, you know, we deal with the person in the environment. And usually, you know, the psychologists deal with the person, the mind and sports performance. And so we have a lot to offer. And fast forward today, you know, when you look at the plethora of issues that are out there in terms of social justice, I may be pretty naive, but I don't know too many departments besides social work that teach social justice and that really fundamentally say, this is what it is. These are the steps. This is how we achieve it. You know, the micro, the meso, um, the macro levels. I don't know. And I'm not saying that it doesn't happen, but I'm saying we've been invested in that space. And so just, just, to, just to close this little, this, this little monologue, the, the, you've got to have a vision. It's not that I want to be in it is why, right? It, it, it's not your what, it's your why. And if you're able to figure out that why and figure out maybe one or two niches with regard to, um, to what you wanna do, then you're in a powerful space. For me, I can't really figure out <laughs> what it is that I wanna do. Um, I do a little bit of direct practice. You know, I do groups with teams. I do have individual athletes. I do some social justice work, um, but now I'm also working on an app. You know, because I'm like, you know, I like to work with everybody, but I can't. So how can I? Hey, I can design an app so everybody can use it. You've got to have a vision for this. And I, and I think that that's what's most important if you if you want to get in this space. That's a really good point, Emmett. You mentioned a lot of things that um, I was thinking about, too, about skill sets for social work is you're nimble, right? You're, you're interested in learning more, that growth mindset and coming from a, a strengths-based approach to all of this is really important. I know for me, I was a former soccer player. So I played four years of college soccer, but as, at the club le level, because a hundred years ago, that's how they let us play soccer was as a club league. But through that opportunity, I became our club uh, captain, our team captain. I participated on campus service opportunities. I did fundraising as a part of that. And I think ultimately, you know, ended up in social work because I liked working with the community and being somewhat of an organizer. And so for me, the sport aspect of it was probably one of the least reasons that drew me to this work. I, like I said, I, I, I know athletes across all levels now, professional athletes, Olympic athletes, Paralympians. I work predominantly with student athletes at various colleges all across the U.S., but honestly, sometimes they ask sport, they talk about sports stuff. I'm like, I have no idea what you're talking about, about your sport, but let's talk about your mental health or let's talk about your advocacy efforts. How are things going for you within your community, right? Those are things I like talking to them about and are what drivers for me. So using my active listening skills or my community organizing skills, um, communication, right? Trying to figure out how to communicate most effectively. And then on the more macro side is, you know, working out, systems and support, if it's research. Um, we did a whole research project with Nike around trauma-informed uh, physical activity sessions, right? And so trying to figure out how we could work with athletes to go help kids and communities, but that is a trauma-informed approach. So that was cool to me. That was something that had not happened um, at our work and just bringing in that trauma-informed language into our daily space was um, fascinating and challenging. So I, I do think to Emmett's point, like you have to be a bit of a driver and also a listener and figure out um, where you can plug in your skill set as a social worker. Yeah, but it's also that that creativity that Suzanne mentioned. I mean, you know, how many of us think about trauma-informed care and how it relates to sports or exercise, right? I mean, 
You know, I think about the story of DeAndre Hopkins, who saw his father go to jail, saw various men whom his mom dated afterwards, watched as his mom had acid thrown on her by a jealous woman. And all of this happened before he went to college. And was there a social worker or a psychologist who could build rapport with DeAndre Hopkins to help him work through this? I don't know. Um, But the reality that what Suzanne mentions in terms of, you know, trauma-informed care just speaks to the creativity that you Mm -hmm. need to have, right? I've got this skill set. I've identified this need. How can I creatively create a space and a niche for myself? Mm -hmm. And, you know, to to, to Suzanne's point, you know, um, one of the things that I found is like, you know, a lot of the athletes that I talk to don't want to talk about sports. Right. They want somebody to talk to them about someone else yeah, or something else, mm-hmm. which, which has been very intriguing to me. So, you know, it, it just goes back to, you know, you, 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 you acquire, you acquire the skills. It's what you got, it's, it's what you will do with them. And, 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 and so if we think about today, right. So, you know, some of the issues that we're thinking about today with our athletes, of course, is social justice, like how on a fundamental level, can athletes pursue social justice? And that's easy for us to say, right? It's easy for us to say, go pursue social justice, you know, and risk your endorsements, risk your fan base, and risk relationships with other folks who may have different ideas or political affiliations or backgrounds. That's easier for us to say, right? So how do we get athletes involved in that in in a way that works for them? Another issue right now. You know, I look at the example of Appalachian State, right? Their football team hasn't played in two weeks. They're going to play a game this Saturday. I wonder how many kids are going to suffer season-ending injuries. And so you think about, you know, our loss and grief training and how we can apply that to injured athletes. Right. Okay. Or, you know, you know, you go back to the trauma piece again. Or right now, just dealing with identity development, right? I mean, we do that all the time. But right now, we've got kids who are not going to play this semester. They probably won't play this semester, next semester. And they're really not sure what's going to happen in terms of college sports because now we're, we're cutting teams, um, we're cutting schedules, we're cutting budgets. And so the one part I said is that you have to have the skill set, right? Second part, you've got to be that salesperson. But the other part is that you have to know about athletics, whether it's college sports, high school sports, or pro sports, in terms of the fundamental issues and how they work. And there's some people that I that I that I'm seeing on the line right now, like a like a Ryan McAdams, who 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 knows, you know, about women's basketball and the inner workings of that. So you can come with these great ideas, but you know, do you understand the inner workings of that particular system? And it goes back to social work, right? In mm-hmm. sports, in sports and college sports, they're micro, they're they're macro systems, they're meso systems, they're micro systems. You know, these things exist. And so it's, it's really, it's a really fascinating exercise. You know, it, that's the thing that, that makes me really passionate about this because, you know, what we do and what we learn in our practice is just, you know, uh, uh, is, is represented so well um, when we talk about the different sports levels. And, you know, again, before I stop one of my long monologues, uh, you know, the, the, the pro sports, you know, and I've, I've had the, the, the pleasure of, of doing work in the NFL and the NBA for, for a short time. And college sports, I've worked in college sports from the University of Maryland, the Rutgers, UTSA, University of Texas, and various teams there. It's awesome. It's, it's incredible, right? There's nothing. Like, I still got Longhorn gear, right? But at the end of the day, you know, my advice to, to some of our participants is don't sleep on the high school, the junior high, and the youth sports. <laughs> That's where a lot of the money is. You know, yeah. that's where a lot, and I say a lot of the money because that's where a lot of the resources are, right? It's nothing right now for a club team to bring in a social worker. Um, it's nothing for a Title I school to bring in a social worker to work with athletes. Um, right. It's nothing for a youth sports program to come in. So don't set your sights on those levels. Um, the, the, the other, the youth and the high school sports have opportunities as well. Yeah, we were just talking about that, Emmett. I'm so glad you brought that up. And um just the, the levels of youth sports development and then how it's evolved over time and just all the different pockets of funding and resources. Um, I think, again, just looking at the job board and the alliance of social workers has grown 
exponentially. So not just that collegiate level or pro and Olympic level, but also those younger levels as well. It's kind of startling to be honest. Um, I know there's some questions that came in that people had. And so I wanted to make sure we got to those and then remind folks there are, there's the chat feature. If you want to ask a couple questions, we are more than happy to take questions. I did also put uh, the Athletes for Hope website up there and then we'll throw the Alliance and Emmett put up whatever you want to put up in your uh, chat as well. So the first question I see here that came in, oops, I just lost it, was how does one exactly incorporate design thinking into sports and social work? How does one incorporate design thinking into sports and social work? That's a great question. Um, do you want me to stab at it or how, do you want to go first? <laughs> go ahead. No, I've been talking too much. Go ahead. No, it's okay. I just, I had to take a moment. I was like design thinking. So I don't know much, I guess, about design thinking, but I think about innovation and like problem solving. And so I think maybe that's what the question's about. So, to, you know, to what Emmett was talking about. And I think what I face in my daily job, and then again, working with pro Olympic, Paralympic or student athletes is you have to be. Um, a bit innovative in some of our approaches, especially during the pandemic. We've all had to kind of change our, our approaches. Previously, um, we did a lot of work one-on-one -on -one with athletes because if you send mass emails, they don't read our emails. And so we found texting or um, connecting via WhatsApp to be the best approach. However, that personal connection can sometimes be cumbersome, right? Well, we started with 12 or 13 founders. We have now 7,500 athletes we're trying to connect with. So we've been trying to be innovative in our approach to engaging with them via social media or um, using, like I said, WhatsApp or other kind of features to just communicate our basic problems. We also do a lot of our communication via um, SMS texting or just individual texting. So um, we've changed the way we operate from doing in-person workshops and meeting people face-to-face, -face, obviously, to doing everything virtual or offering um, trainings and things like that that are in a more virtual space. So that's one of the things that I thought of, but our athletes are so diverse. They're so, we work with 25 different sports across every different level. And so um, we have to be responsive as a nonprofit. And I think that's the key to it. I don't know if that answers your question, but Emma, do you wanna to talk to that at all? I'm still trying to figure out what design means. So if that person <laughs> design thinking, yeah, I was like, okay. And if someone's here that asked the question wants to add to that, but I think design thinking to me is just that, you know, being uh, innovative in our approach. And we always say as a nonprofit at Athletes for Hope that we are cause neutral or cosnostic, which I think is a made up word that my CEO made up. But um, it basically means that we're about what our athletes are about. And so we're not about autism or veterans or homelessness. We are about the 7,500 different charities that our athletes are about. And so sometimes for us that, that we get lost, right? The Athletes for Hope mission is about connecting and educating athletes to causes. And so um, that has inspired us to be a little more innovative in our approach as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll defer to you on that question. But okay, great. If the, per if the person's online, it, it's an edit question. Yeah, yeah. But I'll take the next question. Okay. Do you want me to read it or do you want to read it? Yes, please. I'm looking I'll, mod I'll moderate. Okay. <laughs> so, okay. So, so many athletes struggling with anxiety or related disorders, such as OCD, are told that they have to be this way in order to be good. So they keep quiet and they don't seek help. How can athletes uh, support and create a safe space for other athletes to talk more about their mental health struggles in an open space? Callie, did you submit that question? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, it, it's a great question and it's tough, right? Because, you know, we, we have we have sort of our athletes running this race, this this daily race, what do they call it? The, 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 the thing that the gerbil runs around. Every, and, it, and it's tough because, you know, on the one hand, you know, as a former college athlete, I, I know that some of those things are necessary. Um, but I, on the other hand, sometimes I think about the point of diminishing return. Um, I ran into a college athlete in an airport um, a couple of years ago, and he was a basketball player, and he played for Mark Turgeon at the University of Maryland. 
I mean, he said that one of the primary reasons that he went, if not the reason that he went, decided to go to Maryland as opposed to any other school that he could have gone to was because Mark Turgeon only had two hour practices. And at two hours, the practices were done. I've been in, I have been in one college basketball practice that lasted a work day, an eight hour day. With mm -hmm. pros. And so, you know, we, we, we create these athletes who are, you know, if they don't have some type of OCD um, diagnosis or tendencies, then we create this obsession, this, this, this obsession, this compulsion, this disorder with them. And, and, and to, the, to, the, to the question, you know, I really think that that issue, that challenge would be best addressed in group work. Um, I, I really do. I think in college athletics, we've got to move towards more group work, right? Because right now, if, if, my, if, if things are still the same at UT, for example, you know, we've got two mental health practitioners at UT. We've probably got six consultants and we've probably got, you know, over 500 athletes. You know, which means that basically you're talking about a caseload of a couple of hundred, you know, per person. And so I really think that group work is important because one of the things that I found in group work is one, athletes enjoy that time with each other, especially if it's across sports. Two, they sort of realize I'm not the only person that's feeling that this way. And I'm not the only person who wants to get off of this, this, this 24 hour cycle of sports. You know, I am trying to find some normalcy in my life. And so I think the fact that they enjoy each other's company and that they really have a space where they can talk about similarities, you know, around the, the anxiety or the, the OCD that tendencies or actual disorders that are that 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 are that exist, that is a great thing for them. But here's the other part. And, you know, for those of us who are working in the industry know this, we've got to talk to coaches about it. Really. Now, let me tell you something. If you want to work in this field and you're not willing to, you know, stick your chest out or raise your voice in front of a coach, then, you know, it might not be the best place for you. Mm -hmm. You know, because when we talk about the roles of a social worker, one of them is advocate and one of them is broker. And if you're not ready to be an advocate or a broker for the athletes that you work with, then it might be a challenge. Now, I'm not saying you're going to walk up and challenge coaches every week because a guy like Ryan knows you'll end up you know, you'll end up on Indeed looking for a new job, right? <laughs> you do, you do have to have a certain set of soft skills where you're able to say, you know what, either you're able to teach kids how to advocate for themselves, or you're able to say to a coach, you know, look, coach, this, this, we, we got to do something because what's going on is, is, is really not working. And yes. so just to sum up quickly, group work, I think is important. I think really real, I, I think using COVID, right, as a platform to talk about, you know what, really, we can do athletics in a different way. Mm -hmm. COVID, COVID has proven that. So that's yeah. the same thing, the group work, the COVID, and then the ability to at least speak with coaches, yeah. advocate for your athletes, if not train coaches. Because here's what I say to coaches in closing, you know, again, here's what I say to coaches. I'm not going to sit up here and talk to you about depression, anxiety, mm -hmm. OCD, eating disorders. I'm not going to talk to you about it because guess what? You've got somebody in your immediate family who's experienced one of these things. You already know what it looks like. And this, it look, the, the, the same way that it looks with your family member, your loved one, is the same way that it looks with that kid. And that mm -hmm. kid is somebody's son or daughter. Yeah. So there's really no difference here. And I won't say it like that, you know, but the reality is, is that when we talk about things like the OCD, the bipolar disorder, um, the cannabis disorders, you know, there comes a point in time where group work and, and advocacy become especially important. Yeah, that's a great example. I put a link in the chat from something we put together because we, I was telling Emmett and Jennifer earlier that um, we did a, a campaign last year for mental health month for our athletes. And we just thought, well, we'll just put some content out on our website. And we ended up having over the course of the whole year, our highest um, engagement and, and share rate was via our mental health blog. And so we were like, huh, this is interesting. We started getting more and more feedback from folks. So this year we created a more robust campaign around the entire month of May and have created some partnerships that were strategic for all of our levels of athletes. 
Um, and so we created some resources that were there. Um, oh, did the link not work? I'm sorry. Um, I, I can send it out afterwards, but we basically created some like locker room chats and things. I worked with some folks at the Alliance on the clinical side to create some tools and just opportunities for athletes to have that conversation, either from the coach or from athlete to athlete. Um, we also offered some free mental health sessions with one of our Alliance of Social Workers, Anita Daniels, who came on and did some sessions with us. So just trying to normalize it, to reduce the stigma, to say, hey, this is something we're interested in as an organization. That was a big deal for us. We are not a mental health organization. However, we were hearing over and over again that our athletes wanted to have these kinds of conversations. And, and so if it were participating in the clinical session, if it were sharing the resources with their teammates, or even just, hey, here's some graphics about mental health, feel free to share them as kind of a passive way to include, include them and normalize it. Those were all things that we did as an organization. And um, that was pretty, pretty awesome to see. Yeah. So I'll just add ESPN did a nice piece on mental health and pro sports and they actually yes. featured an athlete with OTD. Oh, good. That's awesome. So oh, and I see your scorecards coming out. That's going to be fantastic. Yeah, we're really, we've, we've worked really hard, um, you know, on this piece and yeah, we're really excited about it. And, uh, okay. I just sent the chat again. So great. The other question here is, and I'm an Ellis, LCSW interested in moving into the sports social work industry. Would love to hear more about where to start and how to increase specific skill sets needed for those roles. That's a great question. I'm going to pass that to you, sir. <laughs> As someone who's not an LCSW, what would you recommend, Emmett? Yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still on the path. I've been on it for seems like forever. I know, right? Oof. I started and then I stopped and then I, oh gosh, it's been a, anyway. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, I'll just speak from a college sports space and then you can sort of apply that, right? So first, sure. I think the, the one of the things that's important is that you understand the demography of the athletic department or sports team. And by the demography, how is it set up? Like, for example, and I'll use UT example, you know, because I think, you know, we've got one of the best programs in the country, but there are, what, five, four or five MSWs who work in academic support in UT athletics. Right. So that's not mental health. It's right. academic support. We've got MSWs over there, you know, a couple of graduates from our school. So you got to understand that right now in college athletics, you've got academic support, you got student athlete development, and then you've got mental health. Right. So for a LCSW or LMSW, you got three spaces in college athletics, at least that you could work in. Right. And so then understanding the demography means that you know, sort of if you're in mental health, you are under sports medicine. If you are in um, student athlete development or you are in academic support services, you are under student services. And these things become relevant because they are relevant because it's the way you'll write a cover letter. Mm -hmm. Like if I'm gonna write a cover letter to somebody in sports medicine, it's gonna be different than how I write it for someone in academic support. So you gotta be able to understand sort of the demography of that. And, you know, it could be something as, it's not simple, but looking at, you know, Google UNC athletic department directory and just start to look at it and understand how it's set up. Very few athletic departments are gonna show you an organizational chart, like where people fall. But, you know, athletic director, external, internal, and then it goes from there. So understanding that, or if you wanna be in pro sports, you know, most of the folks in pro sports, you're gonna be in, in player um, development, player personnel, Mm -hmm. But then you know that, you know, the NBA um, has mandated clinicians for teams part-time. The NFL has mandated clinicians for teams full-time. We know that Major League Baseball has probably been the best, you know, Major League Baseball actually has um, a disabled list that you can be put on the disabled list based on a mental health issue. And that's been for the past 39 years or so, mm -hmm. right? So just sort of understanding, and then Major League Baseball, you know, it's not a mental health professional as much as it is a mental performance coach. So just understanding some of the language. It's like, um, you know, the Philadelphia 76ers, they had a, an opportunity um, that was open for a performance coach and somebody reached out to him and I said, yeah, apply for it. Who, who cares? You know, and here's the other thing, who cares what they asked for? <laughs> you, you tell them that you can do this and some more. Exactly. 
it was like the job was for a sports performance person. And I said, look, this is what you need to do. You need to tell them before they can perform on the court, they got to be right off the court and you can help them off the court. You know, so sometimes you're going to see jobs that seem like eh, that's not quite I, the, the title sounds like what I want to do, but the yep. job description doesn't sound anything like what I'm capable of doing. Write the damn cover letter anyway. Like, what do you have to lose? Yeah. You know, you might come across, and I, I was saying to the person, you might come across a person like Doc Rivers, who's now the coach at the Philadelphia 76ers and used to be at the LA Clippers. And very few people know this, but Doc Rivers, and unfortunately it didn't work out for him as well, but Doc Rivers had three mental health professionals on his, on his um, staff with the Clippers. Three, including D Brown, the former slam dunk champion. So the other thing that I'll say, and, and then I'll stop, you know, again, one of my long monologues, I try and be conscious of not talking so much, but I get so excited about it. <laughs> I, I, I truly get excited about it. Monica, you know how excited I get about this. It's <laughs> like I can't contain myself. But, you know, um, D Brown, you know, Doc Rivers, you know, actually hired a former slam dunk champion, D Brown, and his title was something like Director of Mental Health and Performance. You know, so my other thing is that what I was going to say is that you've really got to know sort of the history too, right? So you got to know, you know, who's the athletic director or who's the owner. You have it, it, the networking and the, the, the way that you make connections and, and hit pressure points in athletics is no different than you would do in the business world. Yeah. And so you've really got to sort of pay attention to who the players are and and how the organizations, I mean, every MBA, every entire MBA organization with every staffer is online. Yep. It's online. So you can find out that information and see how things are set up. Yeah. Those are great examples, Emmett. And I totally agree with you on, at least on the collegiate level, the, um, the structure of how things operate and like job titles or like where you could get in as a social worker and LCSW is very confusing. I think it's purposely confusing. NCAA has so many rules and regulations as well. So um, I know this is being reported, sorry, NCAA, but there's just, there's a lot to it, right? And so knowing kind of who's already working that space or just connecting with people, I think is great advice. I also really like your advice about just, I I've, I've, only time I've ever had a title of like social worker has been when I was a clinical social worker at Children's Hospital in San Diego. So, um, you have to kind of look for those job paths, like Emmett said, performance coach or finding ways to bring your skill set into the room and having the confidence to say, oh yeah, I can do that. Uh, and I think we're seeing more and more teams, especially the pro and Olympic level that are willing to, you know, take that step and acknowledge that they might need that kind of level of person in the, in the role. So love that you're thinking like that and advocating for your skill sets. I would also say if you're an LCSW and you're looking to hone your skills, volunteer or offer to get connected or if there's a way that you can provide support. I know I asked when we did our uh, mental health sessions if anyone would just volunteer to do it because we're a nonprofit and um, Anita Daniels, our uh, Alliance of Social Workers, clinical social worker said, I'll do it. So she did for free. She did a couple sessions with our pro athletes just um, out of the goodness of her heart and that was really appreciated. She just came on and talked them through how they were feeling. It was right in the middle of the pandemic. And so uh, anxiety levels were high. And I think that was really helpful for the six or seven pro athletes that we had jump on. Are there any other questions? I know we're at 139 and we got to get going soon, but are there any other questions? And then we have one last question that came in. I want to open it up if you want to unmute or put it in the chat. I have a question. Yes. Um, so I'm from Alabama, of course. I'm sure you can tell by the accent because it's probably stronger than yours. But um, so like growing up, I definitely, I lost both of my parents. And so like, I know what it's like to not really have a support system. Um, and I was wondering like what kind of opportunities there are to like advocate for say, kind of like the Kobe situation where like both of them passed away and like they had to push through and stuff like obviously that was probably hard for the team is there like situations where you can advocate for them or like help them get through that are you talking as a team then or working with the entire team 
Yeah. Possibly or like individuals that were closer to them or like relationship wise, like closer to Kobe or like, and say that happens a lot and people pass away. So yeah. um, even if it's like outside of, I guess, the sporting aspect. Yeah, I what we've seen, and I can't speak to all of this, but what we've seen um, at Athletes for Hope is a lot of our athletes that have had that kind of trauma or childhood experience, or even if it's, you know, adult, adult I mean, work done, lost his mother um, when he was young, and he, that became a driving force for him with his work done charities, and he's one of our founders. Um, I worked with a group for our mental health campaign called Holinsky's Hope, and the Holinsky family lost their son, Tyler, to suicide, who's a football player. And so they created an entire foundation in his name and now do a ton of work to support college athletes um, kind of campus by campus. And so I've seen pockets of that where like athletes, perhaps individually or within their team, do something to raise awareness and provide support that way. Um, I don't always advocate for athletes to start their own foundations, only because there's so many wonderful organizations already out there. We tend to encourage athletes to work with NAMI or work with, you know, the Alzheimer's Association or those organizations that are out there because it's a lot to run a nonprofit organization. And so um, that is one thing that we've done as an organization is just help them figure out where they could plug in their time, talent, and energy for that particular cause. Yeah. Yeah. No, AC, that, that was a great question because it, it takes us down another road and that's like uh, on a couple of us, right? So first in pro sports, you will find um, that there are organizations for wives. There's an NBA wives organization. There's a probably NFL wives organization. And so you have those and those wives usually look at issues that impact the whole family. You know, So those are one of the things. Um, right now we're seeing an uprising in college sports. So right now there's a group called Parents 24 seven or 24 seven parents, which includes over 2000 parents who are parents of football, NCAA football players. And so, you know, what I would do is just be on the lookout for allied groups that are related to athletes. I'm sure Major League Baseball, they probably have, you know, um, a group um, that centers around wives and families as well. Because, you know, the thing about it is that sports is hard on families as well. And, you know, Kobe, you know, tragic, you know, situation. Um, I can't remember the young man. Um, who's continued to be in the news. He was the baseball player who had the plane crash. Mm -hmm. um, you know, there's a baseball player who, um, uh, who, who had the overdose um, from the Angels, um, you know, just a couple of years ago, he was in the news. So I would look out for those allied organizations. You know, they're, they're definitely around. You know, and the other thing is this, you know, um, I think that, you know, and, and I, I wish that I had more time, right? I, I really do, but God didn't make, 24 hours in the day and seven days in the week and 365 days of the year um you know but the reality is is that what what prohibits us from dropping a letter to Vanessa Bryant you know the thing that I want to say to you is that you know some of the stuff that you have to do in this field is not guaranteed like if you're expecting if you're going to wait around you know if you send something off and you just wait you have to do some things that are non-traditional. And if you're really passionate about it and you really care about it and you really know your, your subject matter, like you, you know that you're, you're the, you know, you know the word I'm talking about, you're the bomb in your area. <laughs> you know, what, what prohibits you from sending a letter, you know, every now and then just to say, you know what, this is who I am, this is what I'm thinking, or, you know, I'm sorry for your loss, or, you know, what about this idea? It might not they might get it and you may never sort of hear back or, or, or see any benefit from that. But mm -hmm. I, we as social workers know about process, right? And going through processes. And sometimes those processes don't have an endpoint. And sometimes they don't have, you know, a little piece of bubble gum that comes out after you put a quarter in there, but it's going to help you. You've got to, I'm going to say like Eric Thomas, the motivational speaker. If you if you want to be a social worker in sports, you got to have a little dog in you. <laughs> yeah. You got to really want to go after it because ain't nobody walking. There are people out here who are competing for these jobs like nobody's business. And so, you know, sometimes it takes AC. Sometimes it, it hey, drop a letter to Vanessa. 
who knows what might happen? Mm -hmm. You know, who knows what might happen? Yeah, I agree. I think that's one of the beauties of social work and why I feel so passionately about this. I didn't get into social work and sports because I'm great at sports or anything or even know much about sports. It's because I'm really good at program design and evaluation and I'm really good at the communication side of things. And so I came into it, you know, I work at Lance Armstrong Foundation. I, I wasn't, I didn't know anything about cancer advocacy, but I knew again about the process of managing grant management and organizing communities and connecting um, in a macro level. And so that skill set you can transfer into sports and um, having that confidence in my skill set and being able to tell them, yes, I'm a social worker and here's, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, what I can bring to the organization to help us define our impact, to help us to communicate more effectively, to help us tell our story. Um, that's what I had to do in the space. So, yeah. um, so anyways, I feel there's so many examples of this and there's so many organizations that need this kind of help. And it's a definitely a growing field for all of you. I'm going to drop this one last thing. Cause I want to yep. share. I ain't going to tell y'all all my secrets. No, I got <laughs> but if I were some of y'all, I would go think about taking the, the, the licensing exam to become an MBA agent. If I wanted to work in the MBA. Hmm. Interesting. I, uh, let me see. I'm a, I've, I'm certified to be an MBA agent and I'm a social worker. Because, you know, again, one of the great motivational speaker, Eric Thomas, talks about, you know, how a lot of our athletes, they've got it together, but they end up in the newspaper because they got character issues or they got trauma issues or they got right. disorders that they haven't dealt with. Be creative. Be creative. You need the LS, you need the LMSW, you need the LCSW, but, you know, how are you going to arm yourself in a different way to, to, to give the attention of the people you want to? I think you made such a good point about like being creative with it. And I, I remember, and of course I'm going to say the word OCD again. I remember with athletes and OCD thinking like there is something to this, right? And when I was at Rice and competing and like seeing all these distance runners and swimmers struggling with similar things that I was and, and, and talking about it, but then often just being told like, nope, that's just how you have to be to function well. And, and like, you don't need to do research on that. Like I, I was told that time and time again. And so I still did some of the research and found these connections. And then like, it's so cool. At that time, I was like, what in the world am I doing? I'm way in over my, or in way over my head. But now looking back, it's, it's paid off. And now like, it's given me that confidence to say, okay, like, if you want this advocate for it and, and try to make it happen. And so I just think that's such good advice. And I'm definitely going to look up that motivational speaker. <laughs> yeah. Good example. Thank you.